Assembly friends, this is Marvin, your friendly neighborhood community life pastor here 
with an invitation for you, yes you, to help us lead eight week life groups. Eight week life groups are just that, is short term groups that gather in your home, in coffee shops, in places of work. We're gonna provide you all the tools and resources that you might need to host an eight week life group. But you don't have to take my word for it. I really felt um, that it was time for me to serve in the church, and I also felt that God was really leading me to do that. So when the opportunity came up for um, an eight-week life group, I thought this is the perfect time. The great thing about co-leading was that you have someone else to lean on um, that can be able to support you and support the group. Co-hosting with my wife uh, was uh, amazing because we both were just uh, encouraging one another, collaborating with one another, and she added a different perspective, uh, a woman perspective. I have a, a pastor in our group and I have a businessman in our group, and myself I'm a businessman too, and just the three of us, were, we have these shared experiences of, of life and each one is different and the, each one is able to bring um, something to the table that can help us in our spiritual growth, because I think ultimately that's what we're trying to do is grow. For those who are kind of on the fence, I just wanted to encourage you, try it, lean in, the Spirit just fills the space. Uh, this is an amazing invitation to step into faith, to lean into God, and to trust God that He will lead you and grow your faith in that process. So now that you've heard from some of our friends, if you are ready to host an eight-week life group, jump on in. Welcome once again. My name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors on staff. It's great to worship with you tonight. To those who are visiting with us this evening, a special welcome to you. And uh, for those who are joining us online, welcome to you as well. Uh, if this is your first time here, we have a new people stable out in the lobby where we'd love for you to stop by, say hello, and pick up a welcome gift as our way of saying thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, all the great things that are happening here at Christian Assembly, I want to remind you, is found in your bulletins and on your website so please check them out. And let me just highlight a few of them for you. In fact, there's a couple of them for you. First up, as you've just seen, we are starting a new eight-week life group this fall. We are looking for leaders to create space for people to connect with one another and with God. Uh, if you've been thinking about doing this, we encourage you. Now is a perfect time to jump in. Leaders will be trained and cared for by your community life pastors, so you won't be alone in doing this. If you're interested, talk to me after the service or apply online. <clears throat> Finally, we'll be hosting a special foster family celebration event for foster families in partnership with Olive Crest Organization on August 12. We're expecting over 200 people, so we need volunteers to help with games, crafts, food distribution, and connecting foster families with our church family please register online to help. Well, now we continue in our worship with the giving of our tithes and offering. Uh, remembering Malachi 3.10, which says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Wow, what a promise, amen? Yeah, so if you're visiting with us tonight, please feel no obligation to participate. But for those of us who call Christian Assembly home, church, God bless you even more as you give now uh, through our online or our app. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship you once again through our finances. Thank you so much for your generosity in our lives, especially the gift of salvation through Christ Jesus our Lord. I pray for your blessings of our tithes and offerings today. Father, I also lift to you our foster family celebration. Would you use these efforts to draw people to grow in the saving knowledge of your love and grace towards them? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you may come. Well, if you're a visitor or guest, my name is Tom. What an honor and a privilege to have you here among us. And of course, uh, our CA family online, great to be with you as well. If you're a visitor online and you found us online, we're so honored that you're here with us as well. And of course, my CA family here, great to be with you. Uh, four different housekeeping items I just want to mention um, before we jump into our teaching. First, Tommy already mentioned it. We have the Village Christian uh, School student worship team with us. And so I want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank you for leading us. <clears throat> I 
And I want to tell you I'm proud of you. It's not an easy thing to stand up in front of your peers every week in high school and lead them and point them to Jesus. And so many of them right now that are kind of seem disinterested, God is using you to plant the seeds of the gospel into their life. And I'll tell you, as a, as a guy who followed Jesus in high school, friends who seemed disinterested in my 20s and 30s tracked me back down and said, hey, could you tell me about Jesus? Because I saw you following him in high school. So I want to honor you and thank you for what you're doing and your generation. <clears throat> A couple other things to let you know. We had Vacation Bible School this week, which was really fun. Uh, 104 of you volunteered. Want to thank you if you made time to volunteer. A um, little bit to let you know, we had 257 kids who joined us for the week. 44 of them had never attended CA. So 44 kids never attended CA. 11 of those kids made first-time commitments to Christ. Then in the middle of the week, we did a one-night-only invite night for kids that weren't able maybe to join us for the whole week. And so we had 78 more new kids who had never attended CA ever before come. So we had 122 kids who have never been here before join us for Vacation Bible School. And so uh, amazing to see the gospel moving forward in their lives. I want to thank all of you who are volunteers and, and served with that. And uh, let's keep those kids in our prayers. Third thing is that uh, 1115 North, we are going to be launching a new service. I told you previously it was going to be in October, but our attendance in July normally uh, declines when people are on vacation. Either none of you went on vacation or all of you are inviting friends. Those are the two things that are happening <clears throat> because every single week in July at 1115, we've had people sitting in the lobby and we don't want you to have to sit by the bathrooms when you come here. So we're going to open up uh, 300 more seats on the other side of the street in our north venue. If you've never been over there, it's just right across the street. I want to tell you a few things about that. We've upped the timeline. We're going to launch that on September 10th. September 10th, and we're going to need about 250 people from all the different services to commit to make that service your home. In fact, from this service, I'm going to need 75 of you to commit to do that. Now, if you've got a middle school kid, we want you to be at this service because our middle school ministry runs concurrent with this service. But if you have flexibility, uh, you don't have a middle school kid, um, I need 75 of you when the time comes to go over there. And I'm going to keep saying that every single Saturday night until 75 of you do that. That's what I'm going to do every single week. We're just going to keep doing that. So 75 from this service, 75 from 9 a.m. and 100 from 11.15. And so what that will do is it will open up more seats here. It will open up more seats at 9 a.m. and 11.15. Let me just tell you a little bit here. So last July, when we looked at our attendance from last July to our attendance in September, it grew by 300 people per weekend. Okay, look around. Are there 300 seats available right now? There's not. And so that's why we want to make those seats available. And we can't do it without you. Um, we're going to need people to serve as well, to be part of the ushering team, tech team, worship team, and more. And so next week we're going to have cards, and you're going to have a chance to do that. I'm giving you a heads up. That's coming your way. Also, when you come to CA, uh, between now and when we launch that service, when you come, sit in the center. Don't sit on the edge. Sit in the center. Right? If you want an edge seat, come late so that we can seat you <laughs> on an edge seat. But we need you to kind of squish in so that um, you know, we're not having to put as many people in the lobby. That, that's what it's come down to. The fourth thing I want to just tell you is uh, where we're going on the teaching front. This week is the last week of our Come and See series. Next week, we are kicking off a brand new series that I've entitled The Grudge. And I want you to take a look at the side screens that will tell us a little bit about that series. If the series is half as good as the promo, it's going to be a great series, right? So, look, all, all jokes aside, every single person I've ever met, including myself, um, has had painful things happen in your life. 
And sometimes we need help letting go of those, forgiving others. And so week one, we're going to talk about um, forgiving small offenses. Week two, we're going to talk about forgiving big offenses. Week three, we're going to talk about dealing with our disappointments with God. When you prayed, God, I need a miracle, and the miracle didn't come through, what do you do with that? Week number four, we're going to talk about forgiving yourself when God has forgiven you for something so you don't live under false shame and guilt. So I want to encourage you uh, to be part of that series, invite your friends. And then after that, when we get to uh, the weekend after Labor Day, we're going to do a series entitled With All Your Mind intellectual reasons to believe in uh, to believe in and love God and so it's a series on apologetics it's the defense of the faith to help you engage your mind 10 weeks on that really it's going to be a great time excited about that so for both of those upcoming series great opportunity to invite friends if you invite them and they're seated in the lobby when they come just tell them by the time we get to September they won't be and there'll be more seats right so thank you for uh, your attention and all that. Excited about what God has for us this fall. So we come to our final week in the series entitled Come and See. And we've been talking about the power, the God-given power of an invitation. Think about all the invitations you've ever received in your life. It's amazing what an invitation can do. A simple invitation to a cup of coffee can lead to a lifelong friendship. 27 years ago, I made an invitation to a girl named Allison to go on a date, and for whatever reason, she said yes, and then about two years after that, I made an invitation to her to get married, and and she said yes, and so for 25 years, we've been married. Or, Or maybe somebody invited you to join their team in the marketplace and take a job, and because you said yes, you not only have that job, but but now you have an entire group of coworkers that new friendships that you have that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Or maybe somebody invited you one time to play golf. You had never played golf, and now you are forever frustrated and cursed <laughs> because somebody invited you to play golf, and you just can't let it go, and it's just really hard. Or maybe somebody invited you to come to church to just come and see and to hear about the good news of Jesus, and you said yes, and it changed everything. If you look at the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it is absolutely crammed full of invitations from God to us. In fact, God actually has invitations for us about our invitations. That's how into invitations God is. And so what I want to do as we close out this series is I want to look at three invitations from God to each one of us to show us how powerful our invitations can be to one another. So we're going to consider that, but before we do, let's pray. So God, even now, we just thank you for your goodness and all the ways that you're at work in our life. Lord, we thank you for Vacation Bible School, the kids that said yes to you, the kids that got to hear the gospel, maybe for the very first time. Lord, we thank you for the village worship team. I pray a blessing over them. We bless them now. Lord, in Jesus' name, that they would grow in faith and intimacy with you, that that they would encounter you in their personal times of worship, and from that would be the overflow as they lead many other students to you in worship. Lord, as we come to your word now, we pray that you would speak to us, your word that is living and active. God, we gather not to hear a message from me, but to hear a word from you. So speak to us from your word, your eternal word, that bears fruit in our life as we open our heart and mind to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. On your way in, hopefully you got a bulletin. If you did, you can flip it open to the center section. You'll see the teaching notes that are there that you can fill out as we go throughout our time together. You'll also see the scriptures that are there that we will be digging into. So we're going to be looking at three invitations from God that will show us how powerful our invitations can be. And the first one is this, is that God invites you to know your significance. It's so easy when it comes to this topic of of inviting to think something like this. Well, you know, look, I'm just going to let somebody else do the inviting. They're better at it. I stumble over my words. I feel kind of socially awkward. Plus, I'm not always that great of a representative of God. You know, I, I sin and... And so I'm just going to let somebody else do it. But when we think that way, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and by the way, I know not all of you are. Some of you are here, you're investigating faith, trying to figure out what you believe, and I want to say we are so honored and we welcome you that you're here. 
But if you're a follower of Christ, when, when you think that way, no, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna back up. I'll cheer on others when they invite, but I'm not gonna do that. You miss who God has made you to be in Jesus Christ. He wants you to know your significance. Look at some of the things that Jesus told us about who we are in Matthew 5, 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. So Jesus is saying that that the world needs both flavor as well as preservation because that's what salt does. And he's essentially saying like, look, if you're one of my students, if you're one of my disciples, that's what I want you to do. I want you to add some flavor. I want you to add some preservation. Salt doesn't seem that important in a recipe until you leave it out. You leave it out, and all of a sudden you realize something's missing. By calling us salt, I think part of what Jesus is saying is this. Is he saying, I want to use you to help people realize that there's something missing in their life, which is my love for them, a personal relationship with me. You see, there's a God-shaped vacuum in each human being's heart and mind and soul. And notice the first word that he says here. He says, you. It doesn't say others. It doesn't say courageous disciples. It doesn't say eloquent disciples. It doesn't say pastors. It doesn't say church staff. It says you, meaning anyone who would want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. God wants to use you, uniquely you, to bring both flavor as well as preservation into the lives of those around you. God wants people to become thirsty for what's missing from their life because they're around your life. And Jesus, he, he wants us to get this point so much that he keeps on piling up the pictures to help us know our significance. The very next verse, he says this, you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. This world needs light in dark places. Jesus says, I want to use you to bring that light. And by the way, it's not really your light. Like, you're not self-generating the light. It's the truth of the light of Jesus Christ. Whenever you receive that and you root into it and you spend time with him and you abide with him, that light begins to shine outward from your life. I want you to think of maybe one of the darkest places you've ever had to go. I'm going to tell you about one of the darkest places I ever had to go. A number of years ago, I had to go to the DMV. (laughs) It's a dark place out there, people. (laughs) Forgive me if you work at the DMV, but you already know none of the rest of us want to come to the DMV. And I didn't want to go, but I had to go. And when I got there, there was a really long line, And guess what else? No one else wanted to do who was in that line. They didn't want to be at the DMV either. So there's just a long line of a whole bunch of us that were like, we don't want to be here. But I knew that would be the case. And so that morning, I just said, God, I don't want to go. This is like a hassle. I'm asking you, Lord, to help me change my attitude, to see this as an opportunity and not just an obligation or a hassle. So I get there. The line was long, and and it moves slow. I probably spent an hour in this zigzagging line. I think there was like one person working, serving a thousand people in line. And so I decided when I was standing there to just start striking up conversations with people around me. I mean, everybody's kind of on their phone and, and I just decided I'm just going to start talking to them like, Hey, what are you looking at on your phone? Like, what are you doing? You know, (laughs) whose Instagram are you following? I mean, I just started talking to people that, and nothing remarkable happened. It was just talking to the people right in front of me and people behind me. And we started chit-chatting some and just connecting with people. And, and slowly the line moved. I was almost done. I get called up to, you know, go and get what I need and the paperwork done. And I'm walking out, I'm heading out of the door. And as I'm walking out, you know, about to go to the promised land and get out of the DMV, <laughs> a woman say, excuse me, excuse me. And I said, yeah. She had been probably maybe five or ten people behind me in line. This is what she said to me. True story. She said, I have been watching you for the last hour or so that we have been standing in this line. (laughs) When I look at you, I see light coming out of you. That's what she said. And before I could even really think what to say, like, and what I can only account is like, 
this like, the Holy Spirit just kind of reflexively giving me words to say, I just said, thank you, that's so kind of you. But if there's any light that is coming out of me, if there's any light that you see coming out of me, it's not my light, it's the light of Jesus Christ being shown through me. I said, look, I don't even know if you have a faith background and if you do what your faith background might be, but I want to encourage you, leave here, go home, get a Bible, ask God to reveal himself to you through Jesus Christ, look up the table of contents, the book of John, and start reading there. She then got called to go up, and, and so she said, thank you very much, and she went on her way, I went on my way, and, and I don't even know what happened to her. I, I'm, I basically think I'm going to meet her in the kingdom and she's going to say, remember me? I met you at the DMV, right? <laughs> Where is God sending you in your everyday normal life? That he wants you to go with the light that God has given you if you know Jesus Christ. God has uniquely created you. You have a unique set of relationships. Your path is unique on planet Earth. No one else in history will do exactly what you do, when you do it, how you do it, where you do it, with whom you do it. And God wants to bring light through your unique life where no one else could bring light because of the unique way that you were brought up and your unique experiences and your unique personality and your unique wiring. God can use you to bring light into someone's life that no one else could. It could be that there are some people in your relational radius that they will listen to you and not anyone else because of who you are to them. You are the light of the world. And I, I know for a lot of us, if you're like me, and I know you are, we struggle with this. And partly we struggle because we're honest. We look at ourselves and we think about how imperfect we are. How in the world could God use me, as imperfect as I am, to be salt and light? Like, there's got to be a better plan, God. Like, why don't you just line up the stars to say Jesus is Lord every Easter. Like, that would be pretty convincing, right? I mean, if that happened every year on Easter, like, that would be pretty compelling. Why does God choose to use us? I think the most accurate theological answer to the question of why does God choose to use us is this, I don't know. <laughs> but he does. What I do know is throughout the Bible, over and over and over again, God invites us to know our significance, to be used by God for his purpose through the power of a simple invitation to those around us as salt and light. As we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says this, For God, who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light. So first, we get the light. To give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure and jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And then a little bit later, in the same, same epistle, the same letter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, it says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God has decided to use the same people who have been rescued by him to tell the power of his rescuing, tell the message of his rescuing power. God has decided to use the same people who have found new purpose through the power of his love to tell the story of finding new purpose through the power of his love to others. So the first invitation from God about our invitations is you need to know your significance. You have a God-given significance that accompanies your personal invitation. The second thing is this, is that God invites us to know and then show his compassion. Invitations that mean something, that hold power, they don't start with our words, they start with our heart. People are always looking for the heart behind your words. Invitations that have a power, they show God's heart. They show his compassion. Jesus is our example on this. He was always inviting people into a life of, of faith and hope and love. And he did it because he cared about them. In fact, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three stories in a row, three parables in a row 
about a lost sheep and then a lost coin and a lost son, which is often called the parable of the prodigal son. And the story of the shepherd looking for the lost sheep, this is what he says. He says, doesn't the shepherd leave the 99 sheep in the open country and go after the lost sheep, the one lost sheep, until he finds it? In other words, the shepherd keeps going. Doesn't just look once, oh well, I looked around, I didn't see it. Too bad for that sheep. The shepherd keeps going after the lost sheep until he finds it. In other words, he's searching with his whole heart. It's not a half-hearted search. He's in it to win it. He wants to see that one sheep be returned to where it should be. And the second parable in Luke 15, the woman is looking for a lost coin. She had 10 coins. She lost one of them. This is what Jesus tells us in Luke 15, verse 8. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search diligently until she finds it? So she searches how? Diligently. It matters to her to find the lost coin. She's not like, hey, no big deal. I got nine other coins. I'm good. It matters to her. The lost coin was valuable. And then the father in the story, the prodigal son, this is what Jesus tells us in that story in in Luke 15, verse 20. It says, but while the son, the prodigal son, is returning home now, he's realized the error of his ways, his sin. But while that son was still a long way off, he's coming back to the father. The father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. You see, the father is looking for the son compassionately. So we have these three parables that that tell us how God is looking for us, but also how God wants us to look for others. That he's looking for us wholeheartedly and diligently and compassionately. And if that's how God has been looking for us, that is how God wants us to begin to look for others and invite them to come into his kingdom. Why? Because he loves us. You can't be wholehearted and diligent and compassionate without genuine love. Mark's gospel tells us in Mark Chapter 6, verse 34, it says this. When Jesus landed, they were on a boat and uh, got to the shore. They saw a large crowd. This is what it says. He had compassion on them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Jesus looked out and, and he saw the hurt in people's lives. And Jesus taught people out of that compassion. He, he responded to that. He taught them out of that compassion, out of their pain, out of their suffering. He invited them into lives of faith and hope and love. Next week, as you've already seen, we're going to start a new series called The Grudge. Why are we doing that? Because as I have prayed, God has given me a heart of compassion for so many that I run into, and they just tell me painful thing after painful thing that they're holding on to. Sometimes big things and sometimes small things. Sometimes things that happened yesterday and sometimes something someone did to them three decades ago. It's out of compassion. And we need to be empowered to forgive and to be forgiven so we can move forward into our future with faith and hope and love and God's future for us and God's future for them. God is inviting us to look around, to see those around us through the lens of his heart of compassion for them. In fact, listen to this verse. I find this verse to probably be one of the most challenging verses in the Bible for me. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse 36, Jesus is speaking. He says this, you must be compassionate. So this is not like, hey, if you're a sympathetic person, you, you know, be compassionate. No, no, no. You must be compassionate. And here's the level. Here's the bar. Just as your father is compassionate, referring to God. That verse troubles me. I'm married to a woman named Allison, and I can't even be as compassionate as my wife, let alone as God the Father. You must be compassionate, he tells his followers. How compassionate must we be? Just as your Father, God, is compassionate. How am I ever going to have the same amount of compassion that God the Father does? And here's the only way I know to have God's compassion for others. It requires two steps. The first is this, is that you need to ask God to help you remember all the times that he has been loving and compassionate to you. 
The time that He cared about your hurts, your pains, your troubles, and your worries. And I have found that the very first step for me to be compassionate to others is to remember how much compassion God has had for me throughout my life. How much He's been with me and walked with me in my hurt, in my pain, in my disappointment, in my anxieties, in my worries, in my stress. So first you ask God, God, would you just remind me of all the ways that you've done this for me? And then second, ask God to put His compassion in your heart for others. You and I, we we can't work up enough sympathy, enough care, enough concern in and of ourselves for others. Certainly not to measure up to the standard of having the same amount of compassion God does. We can't work it up. But we can remember all the times that God has been compassionate to us. And then we can ask God by the power of His Spirit and His Word to give us His heart of compassion for others. And God delights to answer that prayer because it's in accordance with His express will. What does it look like when that happens? Well, we know what it looks like because we have Jesus. Jesus wasn't just walking the earth, noticing people's hurts and pains and troubles. He was inviting them into a new kind of life, out of the hurt, out of the hopelessness, and into a life marked by faith and hope and love, and teaching them how to do that. Jesus did this all the time. Just for a moment, see if any of these invitations that Jesus made, if they might apply to you, or maybe if they don't apply to you, maybe they apply to someone you know that you can go from here and invite them with Jesus' invitation. Jesus invited a, a religious leader, Nicodemus, who was fed up with religion to a new birth to start all over again. Maybe you need to hear that. Jesus invited a woman who was thirsty for relationships to drink living water. Maybe, maybe you need to hear that, that there's living water available to you. Jesus invited proud Peter to become humble enough to be used by God. Jesus invited messed up Mary Magdalene to be delivered from the demonic and then join his mission. He invited doubting Thomas to look at the evidence for the resurrection and then stop doubting and believe. He invited the hard-hearted to repent, the broken-hearted to hope, and the weak-hearted to faith. He just kept on inviting, and he did it out of compassion. See, the most powerful invitation to the gospel, as well as an invitation to come to, to church, is motivated out of compassion and love. It's not what you want from someone, it's what you want for someone. Amen. Brings us to the third invitation that God gives us about our invitation, which is this, is that God invites us to go into all the world. There is no part of the world that is off limits to God's power and the power of His message. No country, no company, no school, no industry, no government, no city, no neighborhood. Well, Tom, you don't understand. I function in the public sector. I work in government. Well, government's calling us saying, can you come pray for us? Can you come serve? Can you come lead? Can you come teach? Well, Tom, you don't understand. I work in the industry. Well, there's people in the industry that are in this church. And they're like, hey, will you pray for my project? And will you pray for this? And will you pray for the strike that's going on? Will you pray for that? Blah, blah. The list goes on. There, there is nothing that is beyond God's power. And so, well, Tom, you don't understand. I work at a college. Well, God is the God of all truth. God is able to take His message into all the earth. But He does it through people like me and you. Jesus says it this way. Listen to how many times He says the word All. Jesus came to his disciples. He told his disciples, this is after Jesus resurrected in Matthew 28, verse 18 and on. I have been given all, there's one, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth, not some authority in some place. He didn't say, I've been given authority on Sundays. He didn't say that. He didn't say, you know, in some churches in LA, Saturday night as well, uh, I'll do that. He didn't say that. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Not, Not some nations. All nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples, these new students, to obey all the commands that I've given you. Not the ones they like, not the ones they culturally agree with, all of them. All of the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, which is literally used to say all and ways, but got 
contracted into always, even to the end of the age. One of the things I love about Los Angeles is I don't have to go very far to go into the nations. I can just go next door because the nations show up in L.A. People around us are desperate for hope. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're desperate for hope. Maybe you don't know Jesus. I'm going to give you an opportunity by the end of our time. And the most common way that, that people experience the hope of Jesus Christ is through an invitation. Case in point, a while back, there was a study that was done that asked people in the United States of America who do not follow Jesus, and they said that they never go to church. So you think of your friend that doesn't follow Jesus, and you think like they would never, they don't go to church, they would never come to church. They called those people, and they asked them, they said, okay, so we screened out all the churchgoers and all the people that said they believe in God and all the people that follow Jesus, and we're just left with the people who don't follow Jesus, don't believe in God, never attended a church, don't do that, they don't do that. And we said to them this question, what would be something that would make you consider following Jesus or going to church? The number one answer they gave was a TikTok video. No, no, that's not what they said. <laughs> The number one answer they gave was an invitation. We think, well, if they don't follow Jesus, they're not part of a church because they hate God or they hate the church. That's not true. No, actually, it could be that no one has ever invited them. And I'll tell you, our own experience as a church backs that up. Like when we did invite night for VBS, we had 78 more kids come. When we do invite nights for students, always have way more students. When we do it for fusion, young adults, always have way more young adults. When we do it for women, do it for men. We, attendance always grows when we say, hey, invite someone. So let, let me just, here's your marching order from now until the day you die. Hey, invite someone. <laughs> invite someone. Invite someone. Listen to how Romans 10 verses 13 to 15 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14, but how can they call on him to, to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've not heard about him? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? And how can anyone go and tell them without being sent? All right, listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm sending you. You are sent now. Jesus sends you. That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Did you know that God wants you to have pretty feet? It's better than a pedicure. You, you do evangelism, and your feet are more beautiful than a pedicure. Let me ask you, how pretty are your feet these days? That same poll of Americans that found that the number one reason a person who does not follow Jesus is not involved in a church will be willing to do so is an invitation. It asks a follow-up question, and the follow-up question that it asked the people that responded to that was this, what kind of invitation would you most, be most likely to respond to? The number one answer is a personal invitation from someone I know. More than half of the people who don't follow Jesus in America and are not plugged into any church said, if someone I knew invited me to consider Jesus or invited me to come with them to their church, more than half of the people said, I would do it. I would come. I, I, would, I would begin an investigation with Jesus. The number two answer after a personal invite, got your guess? A postcard invitation. Thought that was interesting. So we've sent out a postcard to every home within a seven-mile driving radius of our campus about the next series that we're doing called The Grudge. And 23% of people said that they would respond to that. We'll see if they do. We need more seats. Lord, help us, right? <laughs> the third answer, this one kind of surprised me. A church member knocking on their door. 21% said, if someone from the church would knock on my door. I thought when people knocked on the door, you like pull your blinds and <laughs> like, you know, hide, pretend we're not here, like... One out of five people said, if somebody would knock on my door, it's almost like if they, they care enough to knock on a door. And the fourth answer, a social media invite. So yay TikTok, I guess, right? 
The book of Proverbs tells us why an invitation is so powerful. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Your tongue, your words, have the power to encourage someone or discourage them. The power to love someone or the power to hate someone. Our words have the power to invite someone to follow Christ and be part of His church or the power to stay silent and not invite. There are people that you know who will come to know Christ through the simple power of a compassionate, personal invitation from you. Your personal call or contact might be the key that begins the process that unlocks the door of faith, hope, and love in their life. Now you might be thinking, all right, Tom, but what if I invite them and they say no thanks? Then what? Well, I'd say three things to that. The first thing I'd say is that we are not responsible whether a person accepts or rejects the invitation, but we are responsible for God to make the ask, to invite. The second thing I would say is this. It is better for them to decline our invitation than for them to have never received one at all. The third thing I would say is this. People who say no thanks now will know that you care enough to invite them and they might change their answer later. But let me ask you, what if they say, okay, yeah, sure, I'll I'll join you. Will following Jesus and getting involved in a local church actually make a difference in their life? Well, if they don't just come to church, but if they actually come to Christ, then it makes an internal difference. It's such a momentous occasion when someone comes to Christ that Jesus said that heaven stops everything it's doing and erupts in a party when it happens. In Luke 15, 10, Jesus said, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You want to throw a party in heaven? Get used to just inviting people wherever you might go to consider Jesus Christ and join us at church. So we know it makes a difference in life after death. But it also makes a difference in life before death as well, as in right here and right now. Jesus, remember, he had compassion on people and began to teach them many things as we read earlier. Listen to this extended quote of what happens to people who were not following Jesus, but then decided to do so, and then they got involved in a local church. So it's not the people who just say, oh, it's me and Jesus, I don't want the church. It's like, no, it's me and Jesus, but I'm going to get involved in the local church. It comes from uh, Glenn Stanton, who studies the effect of church involvement on a person's life. There are 15 things that he says happens. Here it is. Over the last several decades, this is the quote, several uh, thousands of studies published in peer-reviewed journals document that the practice of attending a local church is associated with making people happier. Do you know anybody who's sad? You want to make them happier? Invite them to the local church. Healthier. You know anybody who's unhealthy? Invite them to the local church. Increasing their satisfaction in marriage. You know anybody who doesn't like their marriage? Invite them to church. Becoming more generous. You know anybody who's greedy? Invite them to the local church. Becoming more ethical. Do you know anybody who's just kind of an unjust slob? Invite them to, to the local church. Making them more civically engaged and responsible citizens. So even non-religious people who never attend the church are passive recipients of the benefits of those who regularly do. And yet there's even more good news. Active churchgoers are more likely to experience better mental health. You know anybody who's struggling with mental health? Harvard did a study that said they'd be better off if they read the Bible and if they attended a local church. That's what Harvard found out. You want to argue with that? Argue with Harvard. Call them up. Argue. Not only better mental health, but better physical health as well. Other studies show that local church involvement is linked to increased educational achievement, character development, longer lives, better coping, and stress reduction. Still, other studies show that church attendance decreases crime. It also increases the likelihood of achieving sobriety amongst addicts in treatment. So if you're an addict and you're in treatment and you don't attend a local church, you have a less likely chance of breaking your addiction than if you're in the exact same treatment and the only thing that's different is if you go to a local church. Every social indicator gets better when there is a thriving local church in the neighborhood. And that includes the social indicators from the lives of those who are most marginalized and most at risk. 
compared to the same socio-demographic neighborhood where there's no thriving local church. You want to change the world? You want to change the city? You want to make impact eternity? You want to grow in Christ? Then you need to know your God-given significance. You need to know and then show God's compassion to those around you. And you need to courageously go into all the world, your world, your everyday world, wherever you usually go. And you need to simply invite people to consider following Jesus and becoming an active part of His church. And some of them will say yes. And when they do, there'll be a party on heaven and the world will change for better on earth too. Let's pray. So God, even now, before we come to this table of communion, we ask that you would help us apply your word to our life. Some of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, whether you're online or you're here in person, you've been counting yourself out, and God wants you to count yourself in. Get to know your God-given significance. He calls you light, and he calls you salt. Go flavor your world, your relational radius. Go preserve it. Go shine light in the dark places that are around you. How do you do that? Well, it begins with remembering all the times and the ways that you've, you've experienced God's compassion to you and to me, to us. In fact, even now, God, we ask, would you help us remember all the times you've been compassionate, you've been merciful, you've been loving. We didn't deserve it, you did it anyways. So that as we engage the world around us and we think, well, they don't deserve it. Yeah, they don't. And neither do I and neither do you. And yet God does. Show mercy and love and compassion. God, give us your compassion. Who's God given you compassion for? Who's harassed and helpless in your life like a sheep without a shepherd? Where is he inviting you to have pretty feet? carrying the good news of the gospel. Father, who do you want us to personally invite to our next series, The Grudge? For each person that's a follower of Jesus, I ask that you just give them some people like, that they could think, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite that person this week to join us next week as we launch that new series. Pray for that person now. And before we come to this table, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to give you the chance to do that now. You were created in the image of God, male and female. He created us so that you could have a relationship with Him, right relationship with Him, right relationship with others, so that you could enjoy community and fellowship with God forever, that you would find your purpose and add value to all that God is doing, that you would enjoy Him. And yet sin came into the world and we all freely of our own choice have participated in that rebellion against God. Your sin might be different than my sin, but the scriptures are clear. We all have gone astray. None of us are righteous on our own apart from Jesus Christ. And the wages of sin is death, a spiritual death, a physical death, a emotional death, a relational death. And yet the free gift of God, according to the book of Romans, is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And that eternal life doesn't just start when you die. It happens the moment you say yes to Jesus Christ. And he begins to set about the restoration effort to make all things new in your life. Your mental health new. Your relational health new. Your relationship with God being made new. You can be reconciled with God and have peace with God. How does that happen? What well, happens because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He paid for your sin, my sin. All who would come to him. Whoever would want to say yes to him, he says, come to me. And by faith, you can say, God, I want you to apply what Jesus did on the cross, paying for the penalty of my sin so that I can be set free of it and filled with your Holy Spirit that I might love you and follow you all the days of my life. If you want to say yes to Jesus Christ for the very first time, whether you're online or in person, I just encourage you between you and God to say, God, I'm saying yes to you. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me how to follow you all the days of my life. Let me take my unique place in your kingdom. Let me know my significance and experience your compassion and go into all my world with your message. If you said yes to Jesus for the very first time, I want to welcome you into the family of Christ, the family of God, the very next step you have is to be baptized.
On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ gathered a, his group of disciples. He took a loaf of bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. He took it, he blessed it, he broke it. He gave it to them and said, take and eat of it, all of you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Don't take the communion yet. Likewise, he took a cup and he said, this is a cup of the shedding of my blood. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And what are we remembering? That Christ died for us while we were still yet sinners so that we could be made right with God. And we can say yes to him. And we can commune with him. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, whether you just made that decision or you've made it before, you're welcome at this table. Before we receive communion, let's pray. So God, even now, I pray that you would help us. If there's any sin you need to confess to God, I encourage you to do that now. Anywhere you need to say sorry to him. Anywhere you want to thank God, do that now. Who's God put on your heart to pray that that your simple invitation might invite them not only into the church, but invite them into the kingdom through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray for them now. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you can go ahead and take the single serve uh, elements that are on your seat. You can take the bread. And as you take the bread, do so with this reminder that this is the body of Christ which is broken for you. As often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of what he's done for you. And then likewise, you can take the cup and as you drink it, do so in the remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for you. His blood shed for you because he loves you that much. So God, we ask, commune with us now. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.